Okay, welcome everyone to this edition of the Verifiability Talk. It is the last edition before we go on summer holidays. So uh, thanks uh, to all of you um, who made it for this last edition. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Jia Zhang. Jia is our new colleague here at King's College London, but uh, she has been at wonderful places before here as well, and she will introduce herself um, uh, when she starts the talk. This talk is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube, so if you don't want to appear on the YouTube posting, you can join using a guest account and uh, turn off your camera and it should be fine. Thank you very much, Gia, for having accepted our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Mohammed. So let me share my screen. Um, can you see it? Can you see my slides? Hello? Yes, we can see them. Okay. Yes, you can see everything. But I can't see you, but anyway, I can I can also only see my slides. So hello, everyone. It's my great uh, pleasure to have this opportunity to introduce um, uh, machine learning trustworthiness testing, uh, the landscapes and practices. Um, so I'm currently a lecturer of software engineering uh, at King's College London, and I just joined uh, on June the 1st, so so it's about a month and yeah, um, it, it's great to to be here and uh, um, I think um, especially to be colleagues with Mohammed and he's really supportive and helpful. So anyway, uh, so so my research interests um, is in the intersection between software engineering and machine learning. So before my uh, uh, PhD, uh, sorry, before uh, I got my PhD degree, I work on um, machine learning for software engineering, that is how we apply machine learning techniques to um, solve uh, software engineering challenges. Then after my PhD, I work on the opposite direction, that is how we uh, adapt uh, existing software engineering technologies to improve machine learning uh, systems, especially the trustworthiness of machine learning systems, uh, which is also the focus of my talk today. Um, so on the left of the slide, you can see uh, various um, topics that I've been working on, um, uh, especially mutation testing, uh, metamorphic testing, and uh, uh, regression testing. So, so, so I'm, I'm like a, a testing person. And um, uh, on machine learning side, I've been working on uh, testing uh, the trustworthiness of machine translation systems and also code translation systems. Um, and also, um, my current focus is the fairness of machine learning classifiers. Yeah, so uh, why um, I'm so interested in, in software engineering for machine learning, it's actually a very hot topic in the uh, community of software engineering currently, um, because we know that uh, um, machine learning community is such a big community. There's so many talented people. Um, why, why do we still need software engineering community in this um, direction? Um, so, um, so in the slide, I, I have three things that I probably would uh, introduce every time I give a talk. So the first thing is software defined everything. Uh, it's uh, the thing is especially popular in China. Um, um, it, it indicates the importance of software. And the second one is software is eating the world. And I'm pretty sure that most of you uh, should be aware of, of this and have heard of this saying before. And the last one is that, is that uh, uh, machine learning programs are software 2.0. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of this. So the idea is that uh, different from software 1.0, um, in the new area of uh, uh, software, uh, that is software 2.0, we actually um, um, developers, the, the program may just come from the data and the algorithm. So it's it's like uh, the uh, develop way is very different from conventional software development. Um, so all these aspects um, um, are the reasons that I'm extremely interested in um, using software engineering technologies to improve the machine learning systems. Um, so for my past research experiences, um, I before joining Keynes, I was a research fellow at UCL, and I mainly worked with Professor McCommon and Professor Federico Cerro. And uh, I uh, was also a research research consultant for Facebook um, before for about I think eleven, um, sorry, um, seven, or, uh, seven or eight eight or months, and then. Um, I got my PhD degree at Peking University. My advisors are um, Professor Lu Zhang and Dan Hao. And I also did uh, uh, intern at Microsoft Research Asia. 
Um, so today uh, it's about landscapes and the practices of testing machine learning trustworthiness. So my, my talk will be two parts. The first part is like overview um, the um, uh, machine learning trustworthiness testing. And the second part would be uh, briefly introduce three of my publications along this line. Uh, so the first part is the landscapes. Uh, it's basically about our survey on machine learning testing and survey landscapes and horizons. And uh, um, it's accepted by TSE 2020 uh, with actually just one round of minor revision. And we, we got very uh, good feedback from the reviewers. And I think they are like uh, they were like excited to see this survey coming out and they are great. We, we, they should accept the survey as soon as possible. Um, and uh, so so, so it's interesting that uh, in the survey we classify uh, different properties of machine learning, including functional properties and non-functional properties. Um, so I will introduce these properties later. But what I want to say here is that uh, um, if we use one word to uh, to summarize all these properties, that is trustworthiness. <laughs> yeah. So what machine learning testing is doing is actually all about testing the trustworthiness, right? Um, yeah, so a little bit more about the the survey. And um, um, actually, it's I, I just uh, found this yesterday. Um, so on uh, on the uh, web page of uh, transactions of software engineering, um, so there is uh, like a list of popular articles that uh, has um, got accepted, and our survey is among the uh, popular list. I think for um, I don't know, like, like since since it's. Uh, appearance is it's, it's acceptance so it's been there for maybe and like over a year um, so in the survey we uh, collected 144 publications and uh, we um, uh, classified all the papers from three dimensions so the first dimension is the testing uh, workflow that is how we do machine learning testing and the second part is uh, the testing components that is where uh, the bugs may exist and we also uh, classify all the existing working uh, based on testing properties, uh, such as the uh, correctness of the machine learning model, the robustness, the efficiency, and so on. And we also analyze the um, scenarios, properties, and data sets, and also open source tools. Um, yeah, so that's why I, I uh, we, we, we call it landscapes, because um, the uh, area of machine learning testing is actually quite popular, but still uh, very new. Um, but you can see that uh, there are indeed uh, um, a lot of things that uh, we could work on. Um, for example, uh, we uh, discussed the role of machine learning testing in machine learning uh, system development, and we classify the testing activities into offline testing and online testing. And we also design a machine learning test workflow uh, based on conventional workflow uh, uh, to do software testing. Um, and in, indeed, there are like all these testing activities that uh, we could work on to improve the trustworthiness of machine learning systems. For example, we, we could do requirement analysis, test generation, test evaluation. So I think for test evaluation, Guno did a very great talk last time about using mutation testing on, on deep, deep neural networks. Yeah. Um, and also, like we could do bug report analysis, uh, bug trage, so all these um, exciting directions and also actually research opportunities because currently I don't see um, publications uh, in, in, for example, in bug trade, in bug report analysis and so on. Um, so about the components where the machine learning, the trustworthiness bug may exist, um, we know that when we try to build a machine learning model, we need data, we need a learning program, and we also have a framework, or, or we can say it's a library, uh, for example, the PyTorch and TensorFlow. So each component may contain a bug. So when we try to find where the bug may exist, or, or we can say when, when we try to locate the bug, we could uh, focus on each component. So this is the properties that I mentioned earlier, and we uh, classify the properties into functional and non-functional properties. So for functional properties, um, there are correctness, such as those, um, you know, traditional performance metrics that uh, the machine learning community care the most, um, such as accuracy, precision, recall. And there is also model relevance, that is how a model is, uh, uh, how, the, how well the model fits the data. 
And then um, these exciting non-functional properties, um, such as robustness, security, privacy, fairness, explainability, and efficiency, I think uh, is now more trendy. Um, and, and and it's more about uh, uh, whether humans could trust the um, machine learning models um, deployed online. Yeah, so in the survey, we also analyzed some challenges and opportunities. So it's interesting that this survey was written when I, um, uh, not long after I, I graduated. So it's, I think it's, um, yeah, so I wrote the survey in 2019 and I listed all these opportunities at that time. And now it's like uh, uh, almost three years later when I recall um, these opportunities and challenges and I realized that uh, <laughs> most of the challenges and opportunities are actually remain the same. So um, although um, you, you, you probably know uh, it's such a trendy topic and so many new people joined uh, this research domain and work on it, but uh, um, still I would say um, and these uh, um, challenges and opportunities remain. So, for example, for the challenges, um, I, I see a lot of research working on testing input generation already, but uh, for test oracle identification and especially for test cost reduction, um, I don't see many publications. Um, and um, um, it's it's a, a big concern in uh, when we when we work on machine learning trustworthiness because. Um, when we build big machine learning models, the cost is already very high. And plus testing, then we, we know that um, the cost is also a big concern in conventional software testing. So it's like, uh, um, so this challenge actually um, is shared. Um, I mean, or maybe it, it actually is passed on from, from conventional software testing. And for the opportunities, um, uh, so for the um, machine learning community, they actually now they really like the unsupervised learning techniques and also reinforcement learning probably is a bit out of date, but uh, um, it's still um, still the, the, the research um, center of, uh, of uh, many researchers. And I don't say uh, I would say the current uh, uh, research papers on testing machine learning focus on supervised learning. So we definitely need more efforts on, on these aspects. And uh, uh, also there are lots of uh, research opportunities on uh, testing um, the non-functional machine learning properties such as privacy, fairness, explainability. Um, so fairness, um, I, I, I think uh, it's uh, uh, getting more and more publications, but for privacy and explainability, um, I think uh, a lot more research effort is uh, demanded. And uh, I, I, I highlight the remaining three opportunities. I think they are really, really important. Uh, but unfortunately, um, um, I don't think much progress is made on them. So the first one is more testing benchmarks. So for example, when we do conventional software testing, we have uh, um, uh, defects for Java. Um, to evaluate the automatic test generation techniques and automatic, uh, for example, bug repair techniques. But uh, uh, when we test machine learning programs, uh, we I think it would be really helpful to the community if we, if we also have um, some similar benchmarks. And although there are some uh, papers that uh, um, work on the analysis of uh, machine learning bugs, but um, some of them, they I think the majority of them don't uh, made the um, bugs public, and or even if they made the bugs public, it's not well maintained and it's uh, extremely difficult to work on those bugs. And the next one is more testing tools. Um, I, I I actually um, had a conversation with some people from the um, who working in, in a bank, and then um, some. Uh, leaders of startup companies. So they all ask me like what uh, testing tools are there um, they, they could use to test their machine learning systems. Um, and yeah, I think uh, it's actually, it um, um, would be really helpful to developers if, uh, um, if uh, um, how to say the academia um, um, could uh, provide even um, like uh, um, you know, not, not necessarily very well maintained tool, but it's just something that they could uh, work on. And then more testing activities. So as I mentioned before, that could be um, the uh, 
various testing activities that we can adapt from traditional software testing, uh, such as uh, uh, the requirement analysis and the um, bug report analysis and all those things. Um, so um, I think some activities are still missing in the literature. Yeah. So all in all, um, still there, there, are, there are many, many challenges and opportunities in this direction. And uh, for the benchmarks tools, um, I, I always think, think the more the better. Yeah. Okay, so the second part is the um, practices that um, um, for me um, in this direction. So, uh, so the first uh, work that I would like to talk about is automatic testing and improvement on machine translation. Uh, it's a work that I collaborated uh, with uh, Zhou Yu from Peking University and uh, also Yinfei and Lu Zhang, they are all from Peking University, and also uh, Mark from Facebook and Mike Papadakis from the University of Luxembourg. Sorry, yeah. So the motivation is that, uh, um, you know, we, the machine translation is like getting more and more widely used in, in, in people's daily life because we are all from different countries, we speak different languages. Um, but the machine translations can have lots of bugs. Um, but the problem is that uh, for users, if they use the machine translation, um, such as Google Translate, it means that they lack the ability of judging whether the translation is correct or wrong, right? So sometimes they just uh, blindly trust the translations and use the translations. So for example, here you can see it's a Chinese menu and uh, it uh, translated roasted gluten into roasted husband. Um, pretty scary and the second one is a warning um so the chinese meaning is uh, uh, watch your step but then the english translation is sleep and fall down carefully so these are like uh, translation disasters um and also the machine translation can be unfair um so here is a real example that uh, i found on google translate um, so when it's men do good research in computer science, men is translated, uh, uh, sorry, good is translated into very good. But when it's women do good research in computer science, women, uh, good is translated into a lot. So it's similar for male students and female students. When it's male students, uh, good is very good. When it's female students, good is a lot. So certainly, I think very good and a lot are very different. So, so this unfair translation would make me uncomfortable as a as a woman actually um, so how should we handle this kind of translation problems um, so conventional methods is to uh, you know either we optimize the algorithm or we uh, need to augment the data uh, uh, for example we add more training data and then we build a new model right um, so so we hope that this model would uh, have better translations so, however this kind of approach has lots of um, limitations so uh, because they need human um, label when they add new data um, this is really expensive and also slow and not scalable and also because they need to train the new model uh, it takes time it takes resources and um, it's not online uh, detection and repair. So it's uh, impossible that uh, um, imagine that a user just uh, uh, put an input in, in Google Translate. It's impossible for Google, for Google Translate to uh, immediately uh, detect any translation bug and then repair it um, just after the detection of the bug. Um, um, so all these kind of limitations. And another limitation is that uh, this kind of model retraining approach is not bug specific, so which means that they hope to fix some part of bugs, but when they retrain the model, it's different to um, control the behavior of the model. And, and actually the new model would often bring new problems that the, um, the machine learning developers didn't expect before, which means when they hope to fix some bugs, other well-formed uh, translations will, will get affected. So it's not bug specific. So all these limitations uh, means that to, um, it's better to have a new technique to complement the existing uh, model retraining method and then uh, uh, um, uh, to, to, to do real time fix to uh, improve the machine translations online. So that's um, the, the, the goal of our paper that is to have a black box or gray box uh, testing and repair approach. Um, 
and we hope to give a cheap and fast and also real-time flexible uh, approach to improve machine translation. Um, so there are uh, basically three steps. At, at the beginning, we want to automatically test uh, the uh, translation box with test input generation. Um, and then after we detect the box, we hope to uh, automatically know um, sorry, after we generate test inputs, we hope to automatically know whether the uh, input uh, brings a box. So we need test oracles. And uh, uh, after we have detected a bug, we, ho we hope to fix it uh, immediately. Uh, so that's the third state step we call automatic inconsistency repair. Um, so for the test input part, we use mutation testing. Um, the idea of mutation testing actually to generate uh, sentence mutants. So uh, we, we want to um, change the sentence um, um, using some context similar words. For example, we want to change boys to girls or men to women. Um, in this way, we hope that the translation a module, the, this kind of change of words should be similar, should be consistent, right? Oh, by the way, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask me because I can't see your faces. It's really weird to to just uh, talk to to my screen and 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 if you have if you have any questions, just uh, just uh, feel free to ask. So so about the um, repair part. Um, uh, once we once the approach detects uh, inconsistency, um, we want to automatically repair it. So it so if we want to repair it, we need to know which translation uh, is better. But we can't let a human standing by letting us know which translation is better because we want to per provide a completely automatic approach. So um, so here we use a strategy uh, that is I think similar to the ensemble strategy in machine learning. So we um, create more uh, mutants, and each mutant would have a translation, right? And then we would rank these translations to try to let them vote each other, or we could say we, we use cross-reference or uh, majority vote. So in this way, it's kind of an example to, uh, for us to predict which translation is better. Um, so, so we rank all these translations of the mutant sentences. And once we uh, have predicted predicted the best translation, uh, we would, uh, you know, do a mapping between this um, top one translation and the translation of the original sentence, uh, because we know how we get this translation, what mutation operator we use. Um, by mutation operator, I mean like uh, which word we we changed, right? So we could uh, do some mapping between um, the translations. Of, of, of the original translation, uh, sorry, we could do some mapping between the original translation and uh, this um, rank first translation to um, post processing the original translation to make it better. Uh, sorry, Jake. Yeah, I yes. Question yes, just to change the sphere as well. Um, uh, I, I, when I heard your, your way of checking and ranking the different translations, I thought maybe there could be. Um, Two other possibilities. I don't know whether you have thought about them. One is to do a reverse translation and see which one goes back to the original sentence. That could be an option. Did you consider that? Oh, could you repeat? So doing the reverse translation from Chinese back to English and see which yes. one uh, results in the original sentence. Oh, I mean, I, I, I see your point. Yeah, yeah, we, we haven't thought that, uh, we haven't tried that, but I think it, it, it might work. Mm -hmm. the yeah, other one there's some some work that uh, I, th I think they are using that uh, to test the translations as well. Okay. The, the other idea was maybe to go through a different language. So you could, for example, t translate uh, into, say, first French or, or, or German, a, a resourceful language, and then through that to Chinese to see whether you get uh, you get more often one of the two, and then that, that could also give you a ranking. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, I think yeah, I think they, they, they two should work. Thanks, thanks for the suggestion. No worries. Okay, so the final results is so about the effect effectiveness because we have 
two publications. Um, the first one is uh, ICSI 2020. At that time, we could only successfully repair about, uh, uh, I think, uh, 20 to 30 uh, uh, of the bugs we detected. And then we improved that approach and had ha have another publication in ICSI uh, this year. Uh, so now uh, we could uh, successfully repair 50% of the bugs we detected. Um, so ab what about the efficiency? It's really important for real-time um, test and improve method. So if it's too slow, we, we, we don't want users to just wait for ages to get the final results. So here are the results that we got uh, on our own machine. Um, so for mutant generation, um, it's, it's pretty fast. And then um, bug detection is uh, um, 0 0.27 seconds. And for bug repair, it's a bit long, um, but but this is on our own machine, and 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 you can imagine that for big companies, they have um, those uh, computing power, and and we hope that uh, um, in practice, when this approach is uh, really um, applied uh, um, um, by the online translate translators, it won't be a problem at all. Yeah. So to conclude, this approach. Um, so the software engineering method part in this approach is uh, the idea of mutation, uh, that is to in, in change the original sentence and inject faults in the original sentence, and plus metamorphic relations. The metamorphic relation here is um, um, we we not we we not only check the output of one input, and instead we check the relationship between the different inputs and the relationship between their corresponding outputs. So so. It's actually the application of metamorphic relation. Yeah, so it's a black box and or gray box uh, automatic testing and repair approach. Um, um, it's a black box because. Gia, uh, you seem to be muted uh, for some reason, or we can't hear you because of. I, I've got introduced so. Uh, when we do the ranking of the translations, there are two ways. One way is to use the um, probability, the predictive probability. So when we use that, uh, we call it a gray box um, testing and repair approach um, because we still need the model's predict probability. And uh, the other way is that we uh, we just uh, do uh, majority voting or cross reference, and then like uh, we we need the uh, uh, no details of the model at all. So that is a black box testing and repair approach. So, so this uh, uh, approach requires none of the source code, nor the training data, and uh, it's automatic. It is um, very cheap, as I showed just now, that it is pretty um, fast, and it's also real time. And it does not need any um, human uh, input. You know, We don't need to let any, any humans to judge whether the translation is correct or wrong. And it's also very flexible because we only target the buggy translations that we detect, and all other well-formed translations will 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 just uh, be there. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what time? How much time do I still have? Sorry. You could use another twenty minutes. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I will. Uh, think I will quickly go through the remaining two uh, work. Um, so this work is published at uh, ICLR this year and it's elected as a spotlight paper. Um, so it's called Leveraging Automated Unit Tests for Unsupervised Co-Translation. And uh, it's a work that I collaborated with the um, developers in Meta while I was a research consultant there. Yeah, so, this, so the idea is that I don't know how many of you know uh, Transcoder. Uh, so when I had this idea, uh, Transcoder was actually the state-of-the-art uh, um, code translation tool. So for code translation, I mean um, the automation of uh, translating uh, some part of code from lang one language to another language, for example, uh, from Java to Python or from Java to C++. So we want to automatically do that. And then trans Transcoder is uh, state-of-the-art at, at that time. Um, and Transcoder uh, was developed by, by Meta. And then, like I, I, I just uh, found those developers and talked to them, seeing that I'm, I'm a testing person. I know that there, are, you know, automatic test generation tools that uh, can be used to improve your method. And then we, that's how this work came out. 
Um, so it's actually pretty straightforward um, and simple. I think most software engineering community people would think it's 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 a very uh, straightforward idea. But it uh, looks like for machine learning community, they, they feel this is something exciting. Um, so the idea is that uh, um, without uh, this automatic test generation, they, um, they their co-translation model just, you know, they have a uh, training data and then uh, they have uh, the translated uh, uh, code for, for input code. Um, but actually, um, we could use automatic test generation to generate some test inputs for the code so that uh, we could better evaluate whether the translated code um, equals the original code. Um, so that's the basic idea. We want to generate more test inputs to um, expose their behavior differences to, so, so that uh, they, it's better that uh, um, we, we know automatically know which translate which code translation is correct uh, without uh, human judgment. Yeah. I don't know whether I explained this clearly. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, so from this chart, you can see on the right side, uh, once we get the translation of uh, um, the um, the Java code. So, so this example is from Java to Python. So the input code is Java. It's a piece of Java code. And uh, once uh, we get uh, the Python translation, uh, we would uh, automatically generate some tests for the for the um, code for the translation. And actually, the original. Oh, sorry, we would automatically generate uh, tests based on the original input code and then we, we would run it on the translated code to check whether the outputs are the same or not. Um, so for only for those uh, uh, translations with the um, uh, high uh, you know test passing score, um, we think that the translation quality is better. And so in this way we, we, we automatically create a large corpus that could be used to augment the training data um, to do fine training uh, to improve the performance. Um, so we use reverse weight. Um, you must be very familiar with it. It's a unit test generation framework, and it uses evolutionary methods to uh, generate the test cases um, based on coverage and mutation score. And it's also open source. So I, I so one experience here I, I found is that uh, um, a well-maintained tool is is really important for um, for people outside of your domain. Yeah, to um, I mean, to use some kind of technology. For example, when we talk about automatic test generation, if we don't have inverse weight, uh, maybe maybe machine learning people won't uh, um, develop a tool by themselves and won't try this method at all. Um, so we have uh, offline training and online training. So for offline training, uh, we generate the parallel data sets use the unit test and then we use those data sets to fine tune the model. And for the online training, um, so the main difference is just uh, um, when we um, get the data sets, we always use the latest model online. Yeah, so this work is uh, like uh, software engineering for AI than for software engineering because uh, we use uh, um, machine learning to do code translation. This is AI for SE, right? And then we use software engineering to improve this. So it's like SE for AI for SE. Um, it's a novel application of search-based test generation on data magnetization and unsupervised learning. And we, we get surprisingly good results. So for example, for Java and Python and Python to C++, uh, we have uh, like 16% and 24% improvement. Yeah, this is actually um, out of our expectation. So the last work I'd like to talk so about. Can I ask a question about this? Yes, yes, please go ahead. So is it possible to define metamorphic relations on the translation, like um, adding an extra piece of code and then removing it in the resulted translation and checking the equivalence or adding comments? I don't yeah. know, I'm thinking of some, some uh, uh, metamorphic relations very quickly. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, there could be many metamorphic relations on testing that. Uh, so I think um, and actually AI generates 
generated code, um, such as R, such as the those code generated the alpha co alpha code to delivery that paper like uh, from DeepMind. So the uh, which, which one? Alpha, alpha code. I don't think I have read that. No. Yeah. So 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 they they build the AI model to automatically generate code to attend the um, online code compet competitions. Um, I don't think I've read it. It, it sounds very yeah, interesting, yeah. but I haven't read it. Yeah, so, so I'm explaining that uh, um, the functionality of that uh, tool. Um, the, in that paper, they, they, they did a very, actually very large scale empirical study on the robustness of their tool. So they like do all these kind of mutations and see how their um, tool would react to those changes. So you're expecting mm -hmm. that tool you tested here is also so robust that will pass all those uh, uh, all those metamorphic tests or? Oh no, I mean, I mean, I mean, there there are indeed the, lots of work that we could do, and uh, Alpha code is an example of uh, um, how we could test the robustness of AI generated code. I see. I understand. Yeah. No, what I meant was defining metamorphic relation with yeah. respect to uh, the source and the target uh, code. So, so for example, adding a comment and then checking that the result, the, the result is the same as before by removing that comment, things like that. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah, I think there are many metamorphic relations that we can design. Yeah, instead of just uh, randomly perturbing the code to, to test the robustness, like you said, I think you can design some uh, uh, metamorphic relations, like which is like more advanced. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So the last work I want to talk about is a uh, uh, famous work that uh, we did for uh, that is accepted by FSC 2021. Um, so it's called Fairy, a model behavior mutation approach to benchmarking bias mitigation method. Um, so the motivation uh, here is that uh, when we uh, try to improve the fairness of machine learning models, um, there is usually a trade-off between fairness and uh, uh, accuracy. And uh, um, because it's an increase in accuracy and uh, sorry, it's a decrease in accuracy and increase in fairness, so it's kind of difficult to uh, measure how good your approach is because you know there is yeah, there is improvement, there is also a cost. Um, and the literature uh, of the machine learning research, they would uh, often uh, just give the results separately, use different tables, um, or they, you know, do some qualitative, qualitative, uh, an, an, like a description, like very vague uh, description, um, or just focus on the fairness improvement. And and the problem of all these um, um, methods is that. Uh, there is no way to rule out um, those very naive uh, bias mitigation methods. Um, for example, what if a uh, researcher just uh, um, very, very not, not responsible researcher, so the researcher just developed a bias, mitig bias mitigation method by, um, by coming out a random guess model. So for a random guess model, uh, the fairness would be really great because it uh, the model would perform equally worse on different groups, but then the accuracy has a lot of decrease as well. So none of the uh, existing methods could, uh, you know, give kind give some kind of measurement or judgment towards this kind of lazy or naive approach. So so the purpose of this work is uh, um, to provide a, a baseline. Uh, to benchmarking all the existing bias mitigation methods, and so that we would know um, how good your your method is when uh, in, in balancing the uh, trade-off between accuracy and fairness. Um, so the idea is to use model behavior mutation. So why we want to mutate the model behavior? Because we want to simulate a very naive um, bias mitigation method, and uh, the idea is. Um, any reasonable bias mitigation method should outperform our naive model. If not, then like, why do we need you? You can't even um, beat the this uh, um, stupid rand, rand, sorry naive um, bias mitigation model. Yes. Um, so when when we do um, the model behavior mutation, we just uh, randomly 
pick a ratio, uh, a part of the data, and then we um, change the labels from zero to one or from one to zero, or we, we change all the labels to one. So there are different ways of mutating the model behaviors. And uh, there are different degrees that we could model, mod, uh, change the model behaviors. For example, we could choose 40% um, labels to mutate, or we mutate all these labels. And each degree would uh, represent uh, um, the degree of the um, uh, naivety of, of the uh, baseline that we provide. Um, and in this way, we, we could have a baseline um, we, we could then do a large empirical study to check whether the existing bias mitigation method outperform our baseline. Um, so I think you, I think the uh, most interesting part of this work is that uh, it is the first uh, uh, quantitative approach to benchmarking the existing uh, trade-off for bias mitigation methods, and it is the first large-scale study to to evaluate the existing methods. Um, so, so, so the finding is actually the um, very important one. That is, we found that um, bias mitigation methods have a very poor effect effectiveness in almost half of the cases, um, and in particular, 15 of the 15 percent of the existing uh, mitigation cases, they have worse uh, fairness accuracy trade-off than our baseline. And in addition, 34% of the existing methods, they have a decrease in accuracy and an increase in bias, which means um, although they aim to increase the fairness, but uh, it turns out both the accuracy and the fairness um, are becoming worse. Uh, yeah, that's all my talk. Thank you very much. Thank I don't know like how I could uh, see you again. Can I stop <laughs> sharing? Because I feel really weird. <laughs> you you can stop sharing. I guess we, we can go back to the slides if needed. So thank you very much, Ian. This was a fascinating talk. Uh, we can take a few questions in the meantime. So you can stop sharing if you want to. Oh, because we see ourselves now. <laughs> I, I can. I, yeah, I can. Yes, yes. I can see you now. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> uh, so are there any questions? We have time for many questions. Yes, I yes, have. No, please, please go ahead. So, uh, in the in the, I think it was a, a second word you were talking about about testing the machine translation. Yeah. And you you showed some examples of like input mutations where you change student to teacher, like good to great. Yeah. Uh, I could see those examples how they work, but were there like more general rules on how to mutate any kind of input there? I mean, what what is there a general more general rule? So let's say you have a, any sentence. What what are the rules? How do you apply any mutation to it? How do you yes, decide so, what kind of mutation to apply? Yeah, so so for the new work, we actually applied BERT. So let BERT make the judgment of uh, what is context similar and what to change. Because okay. BERT have all those, you know, uh, what vectors that uh, it predicts that, that should be similar so and will the affect the translation. So is the replacement word decided based on this distance I think it's not that simple. It's uh, it's uh, it's based on um, all these. It's like a deep learning model. It, it it considers all those elements in the input. Uh, now, what would I mean? Are you looking for synonyms, uh, synonyms, antonyms? What are you looking for? What, what, what? Sorry, I didn't. I don't think I get your question. Okay, so let's say you have a, a sentence that says that uh, a student does something. How the student gets changed to teacher? That's like, what is the decision making process there? Yeah, so we, we, we mask the student and then we let Bert predict uh, um, what, the masking the word. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so, so Bert would give like a list of candidates, right? And each candidate would have a probability. And then we okay. would fit the candidate, uh, candidate into the sentence and then let Bert give an evaluation score. Uh, we would choose the best one. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no worries. Other questions? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so this is about, in the beginning, you were talking about different benchmarks, uh, also in the machine learning world and in the AI world. So my, my question is, um, in the software engineering world, we have all these uh, things like uh, versioning of uh, software, and then you can see in the commits how bugs were fixed, and you have bug tracking. So you have all these 
like information available and somebody can go and, and mine these repositories for, for benchmarks, basically. How is this in the uh, machine learning world? Is there is there also something like, uh, I don't know, is the, the, the versioning of machine learning models the same as the versioning of code or do these things exist? Yeah, I think that I think mo mo most of the models on they they would provide different versions of the model, so you could you could get uh, previous versions as as well. But I don't think most people would care a lot about the previous models. Why, right? if there is a uh, a newest model, why why would you go back to the old model? No, I mean I mean to historically find bugs and and bug fixing mitigations, right? Because that's what what you do with uh, software bugs and, and bug tracking systems, and then you identify, ah, they were fixed here, so you, I can use this as a benchmark for finding other bugs. So uh, if, 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 they, if these worlds were, let's say, similar enough in terms of structure, uh, then you could also create benchmarks from, from these things. But then the next question would be, what is the, let's say, the, the equivalent of a bug tracking system? Because somebody must, if you don't, like uh, formulate what are the bugs in your machine learning model, like the bugs in the code, then yeah. it, it will be very difficult to establish this benchmark. So is there yeah, anything yeah, like are... uh, that? Bug trackers for machine learning models or? <laughs> yeah, these are fantastic, fantastic questions. I think it's more complex for testing in machine learning uh, models than in conventional testing. Um, because we, we, we not only find bugs in, in code, right? We also care about the bugs in data and so on. So I think currently still, um, we, we have GitHub repositories for those uh, machine learning repositories. You could find find changes in the data and in the code, but in terms of the built model, I think it's it's a very much um, an, an undefined area. I don't think it's some maturely developed uh, technique to track the changes or do those things. Yeah. Uh, if okay. I could add something from, from personal yes. experience, so I try to 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 do these benchmarks. So it's an ongoing, you know, struggle that we want to actually collect one, and it's it's very challenging. And I think there are it's. It's not well well tracked. I wouldn't say that it's very easy to find repositories where you can really witness the evolution of some model. At best, you find some student projects who have put some model and maybe there are some issues, but not more than that. And um, the, the faults related to machine learning, as Gia already said, it's not only about code, it's about data and etc. And that part is almost impossible to find no one puts their initial data and their improved data and you don't get to see this step-by-step -step improvement so that's why collecting these benchmarks is actually i think is much more harder and i think this is the reason we see a lot of stack overflow bugs in the existing research because that is somehow some somewhat more easier so you can go to look at a stack overflow discussion and see that someone put a very wrong loss function and that got fixed so yeah yeah. Good. Maybe one more question before we conclude. Anyone wants to ask it? So, so if we were to uh, develop, a, say, a synthetic uh, benchmark ourselves, say using a simulator or something, how would we start? So, so would we start with? Uh, Maybe some lousy AI and then uh, let it run and and and, <laughs> and fail and, and and record it somewhere and then improve. Uh, yeah, I actually think simulation is a good way to create data. Yeah, I think that's something that uh, the lead feature misses. But then, then probably the natural question would be how representative is this small model that we have created uh, with respect to all those big, uh, say, language models that people use, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it needs some evaluation efforts. But if, if you want synthetic faults, I, I will just shamelessly self promote a bit. You can use our mutation testing tool. All mutation operators are extracted from real faults, so you could use that too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I used it before. It's like uh, very well developed. It's also easy to use. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but probably using simulation is a slightly different direction, right? So so you are actually 
gathering actual false spots in the simulation environment, and then you could, of course, check whether they, they represent any of the any of the uh, mutations that you have seen before, right? Uh, yeah. I talked with the. Uh, is it Martin? I can't remember. The name. And it might be Martin. Like uh, like uh, uh, what? Uh, when when they when they evaluate their robots, do they do simulation or do they do real world scenario? So the answer is that uh, uh, so at the simulation stage, there are like so many bugs for them to solve, <laughs> they can't even reach the real world scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in in many cases, the simulation environment is not very faithful. I mean, it, it doesn't represent all the uh, actual physical aspects of the system. So there is a huge leap between simulation and the actual world. So. Yeah, it's also something that I previously hoped to study, but it requires the uh, uh, collaboration with the, with those big companies, mm -hmm. uh, like auto driving company like Baidu. Like, you know. But uh, probably for for uh, simpler robots like drones and and uh, the ro the robots that people use in the labs, we, we could definitely do that, right? So they they are simple simulation environments for those, and then we have the actual robots. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, think, I think there are some things that can be done in a university environment. So if we have people who teach machine learning and there is a task of developing some model, you could put it as a condition that it all gets tracked well. Of course, you have this threat that your data set is done by students, so it's not like re real development experience. But that would be uh, if that would be better than what I have seen with Stack Overflow. Right. Yeah, at, at least we, I mean, definitely we can, we can talk to people who teach uh, robotics and stuff, uh, and I know quite a few of them. But uh, we could also do it while we are developing our own driving simulator and then how, how the model for, for, for the, so how the AI model there improves. That gives us at least one, one data set. So my colleagues here at UZI, they organize what is called UZI formula. I think they're going to do it for the second year. And the idea is that uh, the the participants they should develop a like a DL model that drives and they have like a real track and etc. So this year I, I hope to go there and to, to try to push people to commit while they you know change their model so that can be also that would be very interesting. Good. Are there is there any final question before we close? Yeah, I, I have one final maybe silly questions. So you talk about the transco. So how many programming language can you support? So or just you show the Python to the Java or, or the vice versa. So how about if I really put very old old programming language, COBOL and basic, can yeah. it be translated? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's 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 not a universal AI, <laughs> so, so it depends on what training data we use. But one solution is indeed like uh, like uh, Mohammed said, we could uh, do some uh, transfer of the translation. Like uh, we use some, uh, um, um, like uh, for example, we build uh, we want to get uh, uh, Java to Python. We could uh, uh, first get Java to C plus plus, then we use C plus plus to Java. So in this way, we will connect. Uh, they, yeah, need a bridge in between. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's actually a, a, a way. I think Google Translate is actually using that approach. When, mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much here for this.